can go ahead and begin. So my name is Corky, and I'm your host this evening um, with Yolo Basin Foundation. And I'm really excited that we get to learn about the, the red fox. Um, and I'm sure Sophie will tell you a little more about, about this, but I, as I recall, we ended up connecting because we had some scat that showed up here in our demonstration area. And we were pretty sure it was fox, but we weren't sure whether it was the native fox or maybe a, a non-native visitor. And so we reached out and learned a little bit and now we get to learn more. So um, before we get started, um, I do want to let you know that we are going to be recording tonight and um, that way we will be able to actually share this with people who maybe weren't able to come this evening. Um, if you missed last month, we have uh, that up on our uh, YouTube channel. Next month, we're going to be hearing from Joe, um, Joe Hobbs, our wildlife area manager. And if you've been out in the Yola Bypass Wildlife Area uh, since this summer, you might have noticed the big bridges that were put in and so maybe some other construction that's been going on. And so he's going to be sharing with us next month uh, about some of those projects that have been completed and part two of the plan. So that's what's coming up next month. I want to turn over to Sophie so that she can tell you about our visitor and the fox that live around us. So thanks for joining us tonight. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is a really awesome platform to for me to get to speak and uh, I'm really excited to share with you guys um, some of my dissertation research, um, but also some, some that I will be borrowing from fellow lab mates and former lab mates in my lab. So I am a PhD student at UC Davis. I work in the Mammalian Ecology and Conservation Unit. That's the research lab that I, that I work in, uh, but I'm an ecology graduate student. And so, let's see, let me get my, I want to apologize for, <laughs> I have this one, uh, funky zoom habit that I've developed where I, you know, instead of a laser pointer, I do a lot of like mouse circles. So just, I'm going to try to minimize it for today, but I apologize in advance. If that... Okay, so a quick overview of what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. Um, I will be talking about sort of an overview of Western red fox populations and what red foxes we have in California. Um, and then most of my research is focused on this subspecies of red fox, the Sacramento Valley red fox. So that's our local native red fox. And I wanna give you guys a little bit of background about the history of this fox. It's really, really interesting, as well as some of the basic ecology. Uh, and then contrasting that with the Sierra Nevada red fox, which um, some of you may have heard of, it's a very iconic mammal in California. It is our other native subspecies of red fox, although you wouldn't tell from this photo, right? Uh, so red foxes, I don't talk about this much in my talk, but just as a quick, a quick note, um, they come in multiple different morphs. So this upper photo shows the more traditional red color morph, but they also come in this silver color morph on the bottom, that's a Sierra Nevada red fox. And then there are also some I'll, that you'll see a photo later that's a cross red fox. And I'll point that out when I, when I have that photo. But they're all red foxes. They're all the same species. Um, and these are two different subspecies that we have in California that are native. And then I want to, so my lab focuses a lot on using genetics and genomics for conservation. And so I want to talk a little bit about my dissertation research and how we use the genetics to sort of inform conservation efforts for these species or subspecies. And then as my title mentioned, right, peaks are the mountains, valleys are the valleys, um, but also I have farms. And so this is kind of giving away the end part of my talk, but where do the farms fit in? So I wanna talk a little bit about the implications of hybridization with non-native red foxes that we also have in California. 
in addition to our two native subspecies. All right, so red foxes have the widest geographical range of any member of the order Carnivora. Um, they actually originated in Northeast Africa and the Middle East. And then uh, around 500,000 years ago is when they made their way to the continent of North America over the Bering Land Bridge. And, you know, there were, you know, several periods of, of glacial, glacial periods and interglacial periods. And during one of these interglacial periods, they uh, made their way into the southern, what is today the modern day U.S., right? And that was roughly 100,000 years ago. And then during the aridification of the Great Plains, right, the Great Plains became more arid and dry and less suitable for these more cold adapted species. The two lineages split and the eastern, the, or the one lineage split into two with the, the eastern lineage tracking the cooler temperatures up in latitude and the western lineage tracking the cooler temperatures up in elevation. And so um, hence it's, it's namesake, the Western Montane lineage. So here, and you guys, I don't know if this was mentioned, but, but you guys can put any questions in the chat and um, I'm pretty decent at like reading the chat and giving the talk, but also there's plenty of time at the end, hopefully for questions as well. So here uh, is sort of a zoomed in view of that Western Montane lineage, right? So, you know, California here, Oregon, Nevada. And so we have four recognized subspecies in that Western Montane lineage. We have the Rocky Mountain Red Fox in orange, the Cascade Red Fox in blue, the Sierra Nevada Red Fox in green, and the Sacramento Valley Red Fox in red. And I've shown um, also the historic ranges as well as the contemporary ranges. And I really wanna point out that the Sierra Nevada red fox and Cascade red fox have undergone precipitous declines in recent years, or recent history, I guess. And then just a, a quick reminder that today I'm really just going to be talking about the ones that are native to California um, with a, a heavier focus on the Sac Valley red fox because that's our local fox and also the one that I focus on largely in my dissertation. So. All right, so now I'm gonna shift gears and um, start with the, the Sac Valley red fox and the sort of origin story of this subspecies. So red foxes were observed in the Sacramento Valley as early as 1880. Um, and Joseph Grinnell, who's a, a very well-known naturalist, um, observed morphological differences between the foxes found in the valley and the, and the Sierra Nevada foxes, the foxes found in the high elevation montane region. Specifically that the um, valley foxes were much larger bodied than those in the montane regions. And he came to the conclusion that there was no way these could be the same uh, subspecies of fox or, or morphotype of fox. And so questions started arising as to how the foxes sort of got there and where they had come from. And, and it, was, it, was came, it was decided that they were not montane foxes and there's no way that they were they were the same thing. And the earliest sightings or known reportings of foxes in the valley seem to coincide with the time that the transcontinental railroad was built. And these larger bodied foxes were, you know, about the same size as larger bodied foxes found in the Midwest um, at that time. And so it was assumed that they had been brought to California by the transcontinental railroad. So that was sort of the standing theory for a long time and that these foxes in the lowland portions of the valley were actually non-native. Fast forward to 2007 when Prine et al. and Sachs et al. Uh, started doing genetic testing um, and genetic research on red foxes. And it was actually discovered that the Sac Valley red fox is most closely related and is mo has the most genetic similarity to the Sierra Nevada red fox. Um, and that it wasn't a Midwestern red fox at all, and it was actually a native subspecies that was endemic to the Sacramento Valley and was in fact a part of this Western, this larger Western montane lineage. So that sort of spurred a lot of, of 
funding and research into the Sac Valley red fox and the status of this subspecies that had been treated as sort of a nuisance or a pest for so long. Um, and so currently the Sac Valley red fox is listed as a state species of special concern, right? That's a state designated um, conservation status. Um, it doesn't offer it any protections. Really what it does is it says, you know, we don't know that much about this species and they're sort of a priority for doing research and getting more information and trying to figure out how the population is doing. Um, we believe based on the loss of genetic diversity that they went through a historical genetic bottleneck with an estimated effective population size of around 50 individuals. So that's different than the census. There are many more than 50 individuals, which I'll show you later, but that just sort of relates to the genetic bottleneck that they went through. And that genetic bottleneck is, appears to have coincided with major landscape changes in the Sacramento Valley where um, we lost a, a huge amount of our native grassland habitats as well as our riparian habitats. Um, and the grassland habitat specifically we think is very important for these foxes. So where do these foxes occur, right? That was sort of, we kind of have a general idea of their range map, but part of this, part of the impetus for, for doing all this research was to figure out more fine scale distribution. What, what habitat types are they associated with? What do they need to do well? Um, and so there was a website created, a report a fox website, and we had tons and tons of sightings reported from members of the public. Um, and data was collected from 42 den sites as well as 28 roadkill. And we did models. <laughs> Um, so based on that data, right, it just sort of course overview, and there was also some very early telemetry data where collars were, were put on the foxes, and based on what was known about their ecology at the time, we believe that, that this grassland habitat was really important for them for a couple of reasons, um, largely because it was a huge source of their prey, right? They feed a lot on ground squirrels, um, as well as some, some upland game birds. Uh, and then also they, they use existing ground squirrel burrows and they excavate them, excuse me, Aiden, come here, come here. And they excavate those for their own den sites. <laughs> not used to me working at night. <laughs> um, uh-uh, no way. All right. <laughs> Additionally, um, there's, they appear to have this very strong aversion to wetland habitat and flooded agriculture. And that's not because there's not enough food available for them there. It's really because this habitat is very unsuitable for them for denning purposes, right? They need something with a slight, slight slope, proper drainage. Um, and so we, we were rarely seeing foxes or, or having foxes reported to us in this flooded agriculture wetland type habitat. Um, and then additionally, we ha had this interesting thing where we were getting all of these fox dens sort of in people's backyards. Um, so this is a den that was underneath a shipping container in someone's backyard. And this is another den that's sort of in this little riparian strip between all of these homes. Um, and we think this has something to do with them sort of using human development as a shelter from coyotes. So this is the uh, den where we have a, a red fox pup and, you know, I don't have the timestamps on here, but it was just a couple minutes later that there was a coyote at that den site. And, you know, coyotes don't eat foxes, but they do directly compete with them. And so uh, they will kill a red fox if they're able to catch one. So again, I said, we, we, you know, we did a model. So we looked at all these habitat covariates that we sort of thought might be important. And we said, which of these are associated with our detections and which habitat covariates are, are you know, negatively associated with our detections or not associated. And came up with this sort of preliminary range-wide distribution model. 
the problem with this type of model, right, is it's a presence only model where all of our all of our reports were were sort of biased by human detection. So it was people that were seeing the foxes and reporting them to us. And so, you know, just because we didn't see any foxes out in these, you know, the middle of these wetlands doesn't mean they're not there per se. It just means there weren't any people there to detect them or observe them. And so that led to uh, the next step of the research, which was largely funded by California Department of Fish and Wildlife and was the master's work of Kathleen Black, who was a, a grad student in our lab. And the main objectives of this project were to determine which, you know, sort of which environmental covariates were actually predictive of red fox occurrence, accounting for that human detection bias. So can we put cameras out in the middle of the wetlands, you know, for for three months and actually confirm there are no foxes there. And then we wanted to use that to sort of estimate how much of the range is occupied by foxes and get like a very rough back of the napkin estimate for how many foxes there are in the valley. And this work is now published um, and I, I, you know, I would be happy, I have my email at the end, I'd be happy to share um, any of that research with you all if you are interested. So how we did that was we took that sort of early course model and we dichotomized it into areas we predict they'll occur and areas we predict they'll be absent. And then we overlaid oops, um, some survey grids on that and we surveyed 107 unique sites within 63 grid cells throughout the valley, sort of trying to get an even spread of the sites we thought we would find fox and the sites we thought we wouldn't to confirm whether that, how, how good that first model was. So this is what our camera stations looked like. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen these before. We have the unique chicken in, in a wire basket <laughs> study design. Um, down here, this is a hair snare. So it's um, like a gun bottle brush wrapped around a tree in the hopes that we can get some hair for a genetic sample from any animals that come to the, come to the cameras. And then each site was surveyed for a minimum of 90 days. Um, and these red dots on the right show where we detected uh, foxes. And so you can see it looks like the model did a pretty good job, right? The white, again, the gray is where we predicted we would find the fox and the white is where we predicted we wouldn't. Um, and it seems like the, the model did a pretty good job. Um, but there are lots of sites where we thought we would find fox where we didn't find fox. Um, and we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. So we detected red foxes at 30 of those sites, which gave us a naive occupancy of 28%. So what that kind of translates to, and there, there, there's a fudge factor in there that accounts for the way the modeling works, um, but you know, roughly 20% of the land in the Sacramento Valley is occupied by red fox. That's how we would say that. And that's the naive occupancy and adjusted, I'll report at the end. So now I just wanna talk a little bit about the relationships that we found between whether we observe foxes or not and those different habitat covariates that we think are important. Um, so, you know, I sort of removed the y-axis on here and I added this red, this red bar instead for clarity, but essentially what we're looking at here is um, proximity to grasslands, right? And then I've broken it up into different, different classifications and anything, um, any, habitat classification above the red line shows that the foxes are using that specific habitat type more than we would expect based on how available it is on the landscape. And anything below indicates that they're using it less than we would expect based on the amount that there is on the landscape. And so as, as we predicted, right, as you increase your distance from grassland habitat, so as your cameras get further from grassland habitat, the, the probability of red fox occurrence goes down dramatically. This was a pretty interesting result for us. So this is proportion of grassland. So we took a 500 meter buffer around our cameras and we said, how much grassland does there need to be, right? And so what we're kind of looking at here is these fragmented habitat grassland, grassland patches versus highly contiguous grassland habitat. And what we observed 
Um, so right was that it doesn't appear that they're they're really utilizing this highly fragmented grassland habitat, and roughly 30% of the valley that is grassland is falls into this highly fragmented classification. Um, but we were also surprised, right, because they didn't seem to be using this classification, which indicates those are the areas with the large contiguous swaths of grassland habitat. And just to kind of show you where those occur in the valley, right, that's all of this area here. And I think that the main reason that this is happening is not because it's not good suitable habitat for them, but it's because there are much higher densities of coyotes in those areas. So they would use them, but the density of coyote is so high that there's a cost. And so they're sort of using this intermediate grassland habitat instead. And then this was a really strong, very strong result for us, right? So as we sort of predicted, um, they're really utilizing these habitat types that have very low levels of wetland and flooded agriculture. And as you increase the proportion of wetland and flooded agriculture around the, the camera, um, they're, they're not utilizing those sites. Oops. Okay, so um, this is the relationship to human development. So as I mentioned, it, it, we think that they might be utilizing human development as sort of a shelter from coyotes. Uh, and so as predicted, as you get further and further away from human development or you know, man-made structures, they're, they're much less likely to occur in those areas. Um, and then they're, they're very, they have a very low probability of occurring in areas that have a human population density less than one. So that sort of brings up this, this question that everyone was really asking, how many foxes are there? And I will say that this is a back of the napkin estimate. Um, in order to do actual abundance estimation, you need to do a different type of modeling where you are actually able to identify the individuals. So like a mark recapture um, framework. So you need to know who's who. And on these, we're just, we have cameras. And so we can say like, that's a fox, but we can't say if it's the same fox that was on the camera the day before. So we kind of had a different way of doing this where we said, um, remember I had that naive occupancy of 28% before. This is when the model took all of the different visits into account. And so the model average occupancy was around 33%. And then we said, okay, we know that the valley is around 12,000 square kilometers. And that equates to roughly 4,000 square kilometers of suitable habitat, right? If 33% is occupied. And we know some things about the average territory size of these foxes from telemetry data. And we know it's roughly four to 10 square kilometers. So they're not super large territories. Um, and so we kind of, you know, did our back of the napkin estimate that way and said there are roughly 400 to 1,000 breeding pairs. Um, oh, that's a funny thing. And then I had my asterisk that said, you know, that's not a true abundance estimate. It's sort of our, our way of um, letting the state know, like, this is kind of the ballpark. Oh, look at that. Did it all over again. Okay, so now I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about the Sierra Nevada red fox and some of the research I'm doing, um, sort of comparing the two subspecies. So the Sierra Nevada red fox is a subalpine specialist. Uh, as I mentioned before, right, it's much smaller bodied than the Sac Valley red fox. Uh, and they live in these really low resource environments. And we also have evidence that shows that they're much longer lived than the lowland red foxes, which is interesting. Um, and there's also some, some anecdotal evidence that they have you know, much smaller litter sizes, as well as delayed parturition dates. So they, they breed later in the year and they have their pups later. Um, this is a pretty cool photo. This was a, an opportunistic um, photo that we got back in 2011, where a Sac Valley red fox roadkill was collected within the same month as a Sierra Nevada red fox roadkill. And you can see the difference in the morphology of their foot beds, right? Where the, the montane fox has a much wider, larger footbed, and it's got all this fur. And that really is facilitating them moving around in this deep, in this deep snowpack in the subalpine habitat. Hmm. So, 
one of the things that I do with my research is I actually use genetics to identify, to potentially identify local adaptation. So what makes a, a montane red fox a montane red fox? What makes it uniquely adapted to do well in its environment, right? And what makes a Sac Valley red fox uniquely adapted to its environment? Um, and we know there are some things morphologically that are different, but what are sort of the genetic underpinnings of that? So how do we identify local adaptation? We collect samples, right? So, so these are mostly tissue samples, um, but most of these were collected either through road kills. Um, we had some that were done through live captures in the montane populations, and then lots of den monitoring as well. So we collected lots of samples from the Sacramento Valley, as well as from the montane populations. And then we sequence their DNA, right? We sequence their genomes. All right, so bear with me on this figure. I'm gonna talk everybody through it. So what you're looking at here um, is sort of a sliding window look at the pairwise comparison of the genomes between all of the montane foxes that I sequenced and all of the Sac Valley foxes that I sequenced. So basically, um, you know, every dot on this plot is, is one sort of window region of the genome. And if the dot is really high on the y-axis, that means it has a high level of genetic differentiation or at that specific region of the genome or at that gene, the two populations are very, very different. Whereas if the dot is really low on the y-axis, that's saying that, they, that at that particular part of their genome, they're very similar. Um, and that, that metric of differentiation is FST. And I'm gonna show a couple of different figures with that plot. Uh, with that, that use this style of plot. So. so when we do this sort of pairwise comparison um, between the genomes, we identify the genome-wide average level of differentiation, right? There's some average level um, that it's not gonna be zero, right? Because these two populations have been evolving independently for some time. And so they are on average going to have different genomes. Um, but how different is it? And that's sort of our background level. And then if you remember that most of the genome is actually neutral, right? It doesn't have any sort of function associated with it. Uh, we can, from there, identify these outlier regions or these specific regions that fall well outside of the distribution that we would expect based on the background level of genetic differentiation. And we can say, okay, what's going on in these regions? Um, are there any genes associated with traits that we're interested in. And so there are a couple different ways people do this type of study. Some people just say, okay, find all the outliers and then map them to, you know, a map and tell me all of the different things that are associated with genes in that region. But we did a little bit more of a targeted approach. Um, and so we have these a priori hypotheses about things we think are distinct between these populations. And so we said, okay, let's look at all the genes that we know are associated with, you know, differences in body size or differences in um, like adaptation to high elevation, right? Like hypoxia, oxygen, um, hemoglobin. And so we said, let's look at all those genes and just see if there are really strong differences there. And so we have a lot of data to sift through, but I just wanna kind of highlight a couple of our, our more interesting results from that. So this is, you know, this is again, pairwise comparisons between the Sac Valley and the Montane populations. And this is zoomed in on one of those chromosomes and a small region of that chromosome. So the dotted line is showing the background level, right, for the whole genome. And then you can see here, right, there seems to be one sort of window that is standing well out above well, like highly differentiated from the rest. Um, and it's a region that is very different between the low elevation and the high elevation population. Um, and it was a region associated that overlapped with a gene that we had sort of identified a priori as a gene of interest. And it's this VEGFA gene, which is associated with angiogenesis. Um, and basically it's been well studied as an, an elevational adaptation in mice, as well as in humans. So in humans, um, human populations that live at high elevation, at high elevations, when they have a specific mutation in this gene, 
they um, develop chronic mountain sickness. So, um, so this is one of the genes that we're, we're really interested in and we're gonna continue to, to look at further. And then I mentioned the differences in body size, right? So this is, I said I would point this out, this is what the cross box looks like. Um, and in the Sacramento Valley, we only have reds. In the Sierra Nevada population, we have reds and silvers and crosses. Um, but so uh, those body size differences between the two, right? So we looked at there, there's, there, it's been well studied what type, what genes are associated with body size differences in canids. And so we just took all of those genes and we said, um, are any of those genes, some of these highly differentiated loci in our populations? And yes, yeah, some of them are. So one of them being this growth hormone receptor. So these are some of the things that we're looking at, right? But then you kind of got to wonder, like, why do we care? Why does it matter? Okay, cool. Like you found a growth hormone receptor, you found an elevational adaptation, but like you already knew that they were adapted to high elevation, right? So why do you have to find the genes underlying these traits? So I mentioned before, right, that these, these specifically the Cascade and the Sierra Nevada Red Fox have undergone um, precipitous declines and range contractions. And when we look at their genetic diversity, right, we see that um, they've lost a lot of their historical genetic diversity. So these are two different metrics that we use. One is mitochondrial DNA and one is nuclear DNA. And what you can see here is that from historical to modern, right, both the Southern Cascade, so this is the Lassen population, and the Sierra Nevada, this is this, this portion right here. Um, both of these have, have lost a ton of their historic genetic diversity, both in the mitochondrial as well as in the nuclear. And this year, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service formally proposed to list the Sierra Nevada population um, as endangered, and specifically this portion right here. So it's just the, the southern designated population um, that's proposed for listing right now, but there's ongoing research on the Lassen population, which is here, as well as these populations in Oregon, as to whether they should also be listed. And so, you know, that sort of begs the question when we're thinking about what are we going to do about it, is can identifying signatures of high elevation adaptation somehow help us in developing a conservation plan for these montane red foxes, right? So can we identify suitable source populations where we can say, okay, look, we, we know what things are important for a, making a montane fox a montane fox, Let's sequence some of these other populations and make sure they have, you know, the genetic material necessary to do well in the environment that we're putting them in. Um, and I don't want to ignore the fact that there are so many other really important decisions that go into translocations, um, but this is, this is one of them. All right, so now I'm gonna shift gears yet again and talk about the farms. So this is, uh, this, was, this is sort of like the bulk of my dissertation work and something that I uh, find so, so interesting. So I'm really excited to talk to you all about it. So kind of, you know, I've mentioned to you guys the Sac Valley Red Fox, that's this population here and also the Sierra Nevada Red Fox. But as I have alluded to, we also have non-native red foxes in California, right? So in, in many other parts of the lowland regions of California, we have red foxes, um, but these foxes are not native to California. So they're um, of Eastern origin, right? So remember back to that figure where they, the two lineages, the Eastern and the Western lineage split around 20,000 years ago. So they're 20,000 years divergent and their history is very interesting. So um, they were actually taken from primarily Eastern wild foxes and put into fur farms on Prince Edward Island um, and bred in fur farms for many generations. And then fur farms in you know, the late 1800s opened in California and fur farms were brought from the East Coast or foxes from fur farms on the East Coast were brought to California to populate fur farms here. So then they went through a period of breeding in fur farms in California and then in the 50s, uh, fur went out of favor 
and the fur farms all shut down and they let all the foxes go. <laughs> so that's sort of how they got there. And they have this very interesting history, right? Where they, they went through this, this long-term, not only are they a, a divergent lineage, but they also went through this very long and, and sort of complicated history with captive breeding, um, which what we know about captive breeding, right, is um, they're often bred for tameness so that they're easier to handle. Um, they're often, so foxes are typically monogamous, um, but they will often try to breed foxes that are more polygynous because that's easier for them in, in, that, in that environment. So there's a lot of different things that, that humans do in a captive breeding setting that um, maybe make these not the most suitable foxes to be put back in the wild. They're found in a variety of landscapes throughout the California lowlands. Um, and then in some parts of the state, they are often detrimental to native wildlife. So specifically along the coasts. Um, and there are very few parts of California where they're currently managed. Um, in most places, they're sort of just left to their own devices. And they hybridize with the native foxes. So they do come into contact in the northernmost portion of the non-native range and the southernmost portion of the Sac Valley Red Foxes range. And we have documented hybridization. Um, so we've been monitoring this hybrid zone or this zone of contact since 2007, right? Since we, since we sort of discovered that the Sac Valley Red Fox is actually a native subspecies. And it's really, really interesting because 20,000 years is not a very, is not incredibly diverged, right? But what, what you see here, this figure on the left is um, data from genetic sequencing where the pie, the blue circles are indicating individuals that are genetically 100% pure Sac Valley red foxes. And the individuals that are yellow circles are 100% pure non-native. And we've never detected a fully non-native red fox inside the core of the Sac Valley range. And we've never detected a fully native Sac Valley red fox in the non-native range. And then this figure on the right is showing the individuals that showed some level of mixed ancestry or admixture. And so, um, you know, you can see most of that mixed ancestry is sort of clustered around what we refer to as the hybrid zone or the contact zone. So it really begs this, this very interesting question of like, why is this hybrid zone so stable? These populations have been in contact and potentially interbreeding for over 70 years now. Um, it's really hard for us to tell them apart. So, you know, we've contemplated trying to you know, manage the non-native population around the Sac Valley population to preserve the Sac Valley subspecies, but we don't feel confident trapping a fox and identifying it. They look really similar. Um, there are some subtle differences that, that I can talk to you guys about, but we also know that there are long distance dispersers, right? So in within the, the native range of the Sacramento Valley red fox, we've documented individuals dispersing almost the entire range of the Sacramento Valley. So that doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, and then also the Sac Valley has plenty of human dominated landscapes, which is what these non-native foxes seem to do really well in. So this is a photo I was telling Cork earlier of a non-native red fox at a golf course in the Bay Area. And a friend of mine took this photo and the fox just, walk, just walks right up to you. <laughs> and they'll jump in your golf cart and like steal your chips and <laughs> So before I get into sort of the, the bulk of the results from this paper, I wanna talk a little bit about what, why hybrid zones are so cool and what we can actually learn from hybrid zones. And I'm gonna use this sort of analogy of a genetic sieve. So you can think about a hybrid zone, right? Or uh, oh, it's a ways back, right? But you can sort of think about this whole sort of stripey contact zone region as our genetic sieve. So, as an example, if we have two populations, right, this, say this blue population and this yellow population, and there are two foxes, two fox populations that have been diverging for some time, sort of independently, so evolving independently, building up their own genetic differences, um, 
And we use that sort of same measure of pairwise genetic differences across the genome. And we can say, okay, based on the amount of time they've been evolving, they have some background level of genetic differentiation, say it's 0.25, right? So this is kind of an arbitrary number, but what happens when these populations come back into contact and they start interbreeding, now they're sharing genetic material, right? So they're sharing genetic material, so their genomes are becoming more similar and that level of genetic differentiation or that measure decreases. And as genetic material, continue, as hybridization continues and genetic material continues to flow across our sieve or our hybrid zone, the background levels go down some more. And what would happen, right, if there was, there was no inhibition to this gene flow and there was no discrimination between these two populations is that over time, they would become one large panmictic interbreeding population, right? You wouldn't be able to genetically differentiate the two anymore. And the background FST would be essentially be zero. It would be, you know, just one interbreeding population. But not all genomic regions are created equal, right? So, you know, I mentioned before that a large portion of the genome is neutral, but it's not all neutral. A lot of it has, has a lot of in, important functions associated with it. So by analyzing patterns of introgression, we can actually, introgression being gene flow, right? We can actually identify specific genetic regions that might be maintaining the subspecies boundaries or keeping these subspecies apart. Um, and additionally, we can also identify regions that might be shared at a rate that's much greater than we expect based on how much they're inter, how often the hybridization is occurring. So we'll talk through that as well. So, you know, again, we have our two populations with our background level of genetic differentiation, right, from the first example. So what happens if we have some sort of gene that is associated with a reproductive barrier where like if the two populations interbred, um, the hybrid would have really low fitness or maybe it's something related to olfaction, right? Where um, they produce very different chemical cues and recept they don't, the other population doesn't have a receptor to it. So they're just not as likely to interbreed with a member of the opposite um, lineage as of their own lineage. Um, or maybe it's something related to a local adaptation where something has evolved in this blue population that makes the blue po population very good at, at surviving in its environment. Um, but that gene, right, when put in, in the yellow population, the environment of the yellow population, you know, it's a mismatch. And so that, that gene is locally adapted to this population and this environment, um, and it, it doesn't do well when put over here, right? So again, once you see these two populations come together and start interbreeding, we do expect all of the neutral parts of the genome to start going down, right? And that, that genetic material is gonna be shared freely at the rate of hybridization. But these regions that are associated with the barriers, the reproductive barriers or the local adaptations are gonna stay really distinct between the populations. So I kind of talked about that with the Montane Sac Valley example, but these hybrid zones are really, really unique in that they lower, right? They lower the background level of genetic differentiation and really exaggerate um, those, those areas that are super distinct. Right, so now another way that we can, can use these hybrid zones is to look at selective introgression. So the first example was sort of like the sieve acting as a barrier and letting neutral genetic material move through and keeping other genetic material from moving through as freely. Um, and in this example, basically, if you have a, a mutation or a gene um, variant that, that maybe came from one population, right? Say it evolved in one population. Um, and once these populations are able to interbreed and start sharing genetic material, maybe that gene or that variant is super, super beneficial to the other population as well, right? In contrast to the locally adapted um, genes. So if in this case, we have sort of our, our, our expected level of gene flow with the neutral genetic material, but if something is extremely beneficial 
to the other population, it will just move through that sieve super, super quickly, right? And be found in the other population way more than we would expect based on the other genetic material. And so you have this sort of lowering of the background level of differentiation, but then this extreme lowering of, of genetic differentiation at those regions that are sort of selected for and shared. So I'll share with you guys some of our results. So this is that same type of graph, right? But now this isn't a comparison of the Sac Valley and the Montane. This is a comparison of the genomes of the Sac Valley and the non-native foxes. And the really cool thing is there's a ton of these super strong outliers on the X chromosome. And the X chromosome um, is, is very interesting and it's very well studied in speciation and um, sort of reinforcement. And so basically it can play a very large role in speciation and the accumulation of hybrid incompatibilities. And that has to do with sort of our XY system, the way our chromosomes work, where females have two Xs and males have an X and a Y. Um, and so X chromosomes, just sort of the way that they work, they, they tend to play a huge role in anything associated with speciation or reproductive barriers. So the fact that we see tons of these strong outliers on the X chromosome is really interesting for us. Um, and then I wanna talk about one really cool example that we found, again, with local adaptation. So this is a region on one of our chromosomes that looks you know, striking when you look at it. Uh, most of the chromosome has a pretty low level of genetic differentiation and the Sac Valley and non-native are pretty similar there, right, because of this gene flow. But at this, at this specific gene region, we have really high levels of differentiation. And this gene, this CMPK1 gene, has been pretty well studied in dryland adaptation and um, was actually sort of identified as one of the genes associated with dryland adaptation in fat-tailed sheep, which and is, you know, this is a very extreme desert adaptation. Um, but it's, Another really cool thing is that, so this is just a zoomed in version of a zoomed in portion of this chromosome, um, but not only is this genetic region very different between the Sac Valley red fox and the non-native red fox, it also is extremely different between the Sac Valley red fox and Eastern red foxes, which is where the non-native red foxes originated from as well as our Sierra Nevada red fox. So this is a region that appears to be unique to the Sac Valley red fox. Um, and there's something distinct about its genome in that gene region when compared to these other three populations that all sort of have this, this longer history with colder adapted climates. So this is another region that we're super interested in looking at. Um, and then, oh, and then back to that selective introgression bit, right? The, the, this is really where sort of the, the drive for my research started in that these non-native populations have this really long-term history in captive breeding. And there's a lot of concern over, you know, the accelerated evolution they underwent during captive breeding where they were bred for things like tameness. Um, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of the fox farm experiments done in Russia, right? Where in very few generations, they were able to um, breed these foxes for like floppy ears and they would wag their tails. And so there's been a lot of genetic research done where they've identified sort of alleles associated, or excuse me for the jargon, um, gene, gene versions or gene variants associated with tameness versus aggressive. And they can very quickly breed these strains to be more tame or more aggressive. And while they weren't intentionally doing this in fox farms, um, they were sort of inadvertently doing it because the tame foxes are typically easier to handle. Um, as I mentioned before, they're potentially breeding foxes to be more polygynous than monogamous. And so there's all these sort of unintended consequences of the captive breeding. And so one of the concerns for us is, are any of those sort of genetic changes that happen in captivity somehow going to make their way into the Sac Valley population? And, you know, maybe they would be selectively introgressed and they're beneficial for them in the short term, but in the long term evolutionarily, you know, what are the consequences of that? 
So that's sort of um, what I'm what I'm working on right now is trying to identify that selective introgression and whether there is any, and if it's anything that we should be concerned about, is it somehow compromising the genetic integrity of the Sac Valley red foxes? Um, but that stable hybrid zone is really reassuring, right? It, it makes us feel a little less stressed out about um, a non-native fox uh, encroaching on our native population. It seems like they can tell each other apart and they're not readily interbreeding. I will um, sort of wrap it up by just explaining the foxes that we found at the Yoa Basin uh, Foundation, right, where basically, so this is a female red fox from a den in Davis, um, very close, like maybe two miles from um, from the Yolo Basin Foundation, and she is actually a fully non-native red fox. So um, she is still within the hybrid zone, but she is the furthest north or the furthest inside the native range. She's still out, she's in the hybrid zone, but, but she is the closest to in the native range we've ever got. And she paired up with a native male red fox, a fully native male, and they had so many cute baby foxes. I think we monitored, monitored her and her mate for three years and they were producing F1 hybrid offspring. Um, and so the fox that we got at, over at the Yolo Basin Foundation, um, we're not positive, but we think it was one of the offspring from, from this mating, from this mated pair. So um, yeah. So that is um, what I've got for everyone today. And thank you all so much for having me. And I've put my email up there and I'm happy to, I know I kind of, I had so many things I wanted to talk about and I, I'm sure it was a lot, but so if anybody has any, you know, follow-up questions later or needs clarification on anything, um, I'm happy to, to, to answer those questions either now or later. And we had a couple questions come in. Um, when you were talking about the bottleneck, um, one was, is it known or are there estimates of when that bottlenecking occurred? Yeah, I believe the bottleneck was in the early 1900s, I believe. Um, and the number for that, the effective population size was 50 individuals. And um, another question is, in the photos of the roadkill fox feet, what is the cone-like structure around the foot and why is it there? Oh, that is a great question. I don't even know if I ever noticed the cone-like structure. Leave it to a kid. <laughs> Let's see. Yes. Oh, I saw it. I saw it too. Oh my gosh. I went way too far back. It was like not responding to me for a little while. Oh no. <laughs> All right, we could get the, let me see if I can do it on here. This will be easier. Oh, ah, there we go. I feel like that might be a cup in the background like a, a tray or a dish that might, I think is behind the foot actually. Right. Anybody else have questions for Sophie here? Yeah, I see, let's see. There, are there few in the Sierra or widely spread as your range map showed? You saw one in Calaveras about 4,000 feet this June. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, let me, let me pull up my range map. So yeah, Calaveras County is south of, so this is um, Sonora. So, so the, Sac, the Sierra Nevada population also has a very, the southern portion, right? The currently 
proposed for listing portion has also a very interesting history, um, which I could have given an entire talk on. But essentially, um, it was thought to be extirpated until 2010. And in 2010, the Forest Service was doing a survey up there and you know, they actually did the, instead of the chicken in a cage, they put chicken in like a tube sock and they nail it to a tree. And they got this really weird photo of an animal, but the photo was terrible. And they're like, what do you think this is? We think it might be a fox. And so our lab did the genetic testing and confirmed it was a Sierra Nevada red fox. And so then that spurred a whole bunch of research to sort of find them. And their populations were super, super small. Um, and they appeared highly inbred and they, there was no documented reproduction. So it seemed like um, this was one of my lab mates work and she had been monitoring them and she was getting all the same individuals over and over again and she wasn't documenting any reproduction. There were no pups documented year after year. Um, and then there was this interesting thing that happened where two males migrated uh, from the Great Basin into that population and they appear to have, um, so now there's, there's breeding, right, with those males and um, the population ex appears to be expanding. So it's this really interesting natural experiment of like maybe they were released from inbreeding depression um, and the population does appear to be growing. So if you, um, I don't know if you have like a photo or if you have coordinates of where you saw one, but I would be super interested in that if you, if you would, wouldn't mind emailing me about it. Now I have one here that's, um, is there any genetic info about the fox observed around the Yolo Basin and further west, for example, hybrids? Um, yeah, so, so most, actually most of the monitoring that I do is in sort of the Davis area. And so the Yolo Basin Foundation fox, um, I, you know, did, and in that sort of surrounding area. So I also have, have, this summer, I collected a lot of samples from the, the Cal Fire Nursery, if anybody knows where that is. It's like just adjacent. Um, and so we haven't, we got shut down this summer, so we haven't processed, um, we haven't processed any of those samples, unfortunately. But I'm really curious to see, and it seems to be sort of a, you know, it's not that every fox we get there is a hybrid. Um, there are a lot of pure native, you know, Sac Valley foxes. Um, and most of them are, are native pure Sac Valley foxes. And so we have lots of dens in sort of um, West Davis and then also, uh, or sorry, East Davis but then also far West Davis. So like out in the county roads, we have a lot of dens that I monitor every year. Um, and most of them are, are, you know, pure Sac Valley native foxes. What is the role of the California gray fox in this? Ooh, great question. Um, so the gray fox does not have too much of a role in this. Um, I mean, they are, so we, you know, they are competitors with red foxes, um, but slightly different, right? They're, they're more omnivorous than, than red foxes and coyotes are. Um, but we do have sort of plans because we put those cameras out, right? So we have tons of data on gray foxes as well as on coyotes. And so we have some cool ideas about um, doing the modeling, but sort of like what are the interactions between them? Are they avoiding areas with, where coyotes were detected? Are gray foxes avoiding any of that? Um, I actually have just started studying gray foxes myself. So, um, but at the moment, it's more of a, a broader Eastern, you know, sort of uh, North or US wide. So Eastern gray foxes versus Western gray foxes. They also have a really interesting um, contact zone in the Great Plains that I study. Um, but we, you know, the gray foxes in California are very are a very interesting population, right? We have the Channel Island foxes too. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to studying gray foxes more and, and I haven't gotten to California quite yet, but. Well, since you mentioned the Channel Islands, one of the questions is, do the Channel Island fox off the coast of California stem from the Western red fox? No, they don't. That's a great question. 
Um, so, sorry, someone's asking. Um, so the channel, so the gray fox, um, and there's a little bit of debate in this, but um, I think the bulk of the research supports the fact that the, the gray fox is actually the basal lineage. So if you're thinking about uh, like a phylogenetic tree, the, right, you, you have sort of all the other carnivores, right, and then canids. And so gray foxes and red foxes and coyotes are all part of this canid this canidae um, lineage and gray foxes are the most basal. So they are actually, so, so red foxes and coyotes are more closely related to one another than either are to a gray fox. I think is probably the easiest way to explain it. So around 2007, one of the fox that had a tracking device was tracked moving between a den in South Davis and the Yolo Basin Foundation. Do you know if the foxes found recently are related to the 2007 fox? You know, I don't know if they are. Um, yeah, I don't know if they are related to the 2007 fox. Um, I... Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that would be really interesting. We have so much genetic data on like individuals and we mostly use it to just look at sort of those, you know, the pie chart ancestry and like how much of their genetic material is native versus non-native. Um, but it's totally possible to create pedigrees, right? And figure out who is related to who. And I think that's something also that I'm super interested in um, is looking at this idea of territories and like, who gets to inherit the territories, right? So that that female, that non-native female that I was mentioning at the den in South Davis, if, if I'm not sure if anybody knows where it is, um, there's like a, the city shuts it down during the springtime um, because it's a, a used almost every year. Um, so it was used this year. Uh, I don't have the genetic data for it yet, but I'm really curious to know, right? I know it's not that female um, that non-native female anymore, but I'm really curious to know, is the breeding pair that's there now, is the female that's there like the offspring of that pair, right? Is, did she get to inherit that territory? So um, yeah, there's so many things that I would really love to do and just not enough of me. <laughs> we need more, more scientists. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, a red fox was recently seen in a neighborhood in Natomas. What are your thoughts about that? In Natomas, yeah. Um, that is probably most a non-native red fox, most likely. It's technically the hybrid zone. Um, so yeah, sorry. I actually just moved to Sacramento, so I'm feeling horrible about my geography. West Sac. Natomas, but Natomas is on that other side of the river, right? Like the northeast side. So yeah, my guess is that that, that might be a, a non-native red fox. But really, again, like it's not something where I would say absolutely. I would definitely say that, you know, doing the genetic testing would be really interesting. So if you Are there more coyotes than fox in the area? Oh, that's a really good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, okay. <laughs> we can take that. Um, could there be gray fox at the wildlife area? Yeah, I would be shocked if there, there weren't. It seems like there's a pretty decent, um, you know, and maybe not resident gray fox, but we, you know, they, so gray foxes are, are more associated with like riparian uh, riparian habitat. So anything that has like a nice riparian corridor or, a, uh, you know, like a, those drainage ditches that have the levee roads that have lots of like riparian habitat planted throughout them, that's like typically where we find the gray foxes. Um, so I think there's a decent amount of, of riparian habitat at the Yolo Basin Foundation. So I wouldn't be surprised if they used it. Um, we have a, a question here that's specifically asking about your methods, and I typed, I sent that directly to you. I was looking at that, yeah. So those were, uh, that was Bayesian. 
the occupancy modeling. Okay. Um, and what, what is the story with the kit fox? Ooh, the San Joaquin kit fox? I assume so. Yeah, so that's the, the San Joaquin kit fox um, is, is found in the San Joaquin Valley, right? And super interesting because, you know, that was, that's sort of one question that comes up often when I give a talk about the Sac Valley Fox is why, if they're sort of adapted to this dry and arid, semi-arid climate, why are they not in the San Joaquin Valley? Um, and we think it's because kit foxes are there. So kit foxes are smaller, um, but it seems like they sort of fill that, that ecological niche in the San Joaquin Valley. And so, um, there are some red foxes, like non-native red fox, that have sort of made their way close to the periphery of the San Joaquin kit fox range. And I think like specifically near Lake Houston Merced or you know, one of the UCs, um, they've documented some, some like negative interactions between the two. But for the most part, it seems like the non-native red foxes have not been able to sort of do well in the San Joaquin Valley and they're not there um, much that we observe. So that seems to be a good thing. It seems like the San Joaquin kit foxes are like, even though they're smaller, um, they're, they're sort of better adapted, right? Or I don't, I don't think they could really hold their own against a red fox, but um, it seems like they're, they're thriving in their habitat and the, the red foxes are not. <laughs> Um, they do have their own issues, right? There's a lot of disease research that's going on with the San Joaquin kit foxes specifically associated with mange, but. How does the food source differ among the Sacramento, Montana, non-native red foxes? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I see all kinds of things at the Sac Valley red fox dens. Um, loads of ground squirrels, rabbits. Uh, not, so I said upland game birds. They, they, they're not usually up in the upland grassland habitat because of the coyotes, um, but we've seen turkeys, like turkey pullets. Um, they do eat, they love chickens. So they, <laughs> you know, they will go for the chickens, let me tell I you. They kick my chickens. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it's also really interesting because I, I'm sure, I don't know if Corky has, can attest to this, but, um, people like the foxes and I think, you know, not always, but most of the time are willing to let go of a couple chickens in exchange for fox pups in their backyard. Um, and people really tend to have negative opinions about the coyotes. And so it, it is really this interesting thing where the foxes seem to have found a way to keep their pups alive by coming and denning in someone's backyard um, because people aren't going to let the coyotes on their property. Uh, and then how that differs from the non-native, I don't actually know too much about the diet of non-native red foxes, um, but I do know, right, they are often found in, in you know, I mean, they're really all over, but they, they are found in these very human-dominated landscapes, more urban landscapes. Um, and the Sierra Nevada red fox, I think we're still trying to figure that out. One of my lab mates did some stable isotope work with the hair. That's a really interesting way that you could do it. And, and recently, our lab has gotten, um, has started doing metabarcoding work, which is basically like taking the, the, the scat of the fox and extracting all of the DNA of the contents. And so you can actually sequence the DNA of the organisms that the foxes ate and figure out how much of, you know, how much of it was this species of bird, how much of it was the ground squirrel, how much was a gopher. Um, so it, it's a really cool um, sort of new, newer technology. Uh, that we're using. So stay tuned. We had a comment here. Uh... We found scat outside our front door in far north Davis. Fox scat, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, and let's see, are coyotes the main threat to fox? Um, they are a large threat. Um, I think cars are also a pretty big threat. Um, I, 
you know, it's tough to say. I like, I, I hesitate to say anything is a, a huge threat to them. So, you know, we haven't, aside from the potentially the hybridization, right? So far, we haven't found any huge evidence that supports that that they are particularly threatened by any one thing, except maybe that their genetic integrity is threatened by potential hybridization. So, I mean, I do, I collect a lot of red fox roadkill, um, specifically around like October, November, when, when the male pups are dispersing and trying to find mates in their own territories. Uh, and then coyotes, dogs also, like I think dogs kill the, the fox pups quite often. Um, Have you seen feral cats consumed by fox in South Davis? Nope, I haven't. I, you know, I've had some reports of people saying that their cats have been chased by a fox. I've also had some reports of people saying that they saw the fox and the cat, but they weren't really sure who was chasing who. Um, I have <laughs> yet to have documented evidence that a fox has you know, I don't, that has, has harmed or killed a cat. Coyotes, I, yes, definitely, but, um, yeah, so I, I'm not going to say that it, I think it, if it happens, it's pretty rare. They're small. I'm not sure if anybody has gotten a chance to see one, but they're pretty small. They're not, um, like if I was a fox, I wouldn't want to mess with a cat. <laughs> Um, given the propensity of the Sacramento Valley red fox to live near humans, have they been susceptible to rodenticides that humans are using? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think likely yes. Um, you know, we, uh, and I, you know, I could look back at, um, so I think back in like 2007, 2011, that time frame before I started as a grad student, um, my PI Ben Sachs, he had some grad students who were doing a lot of pathology on the foxes. So, so sort of looking at what, you know, doing necropsies and that sort of thing. And I don't remember rodenticide being a huge, a huge sort of cause of mortality for them. Um, but I'm sure it is, you know, I'm sure that, um, that, that, yeah, I, although I also don't know that much about red foxes as sca as like scavengers, right? If you you know if you were thinking about a rodent that was dead, would a red fox take it? I'm not actually sure. So maybe it's not as big of a an issue as yeah. But I so my research before I started grad school was studying the Pacific Fisher, which if anybody knows is very hard hit by rodenticides, um, and so when I have worked with landowners in the past, I always try to urge them not to use rodenticides. Um, there are so many, so many consequences of it. How small are they? Um, females are like two and a half to three and a half kilograms. And males are, you know, three and a half to five and a half kilograms, I'd say. Can you convert that to pounds? No. <laughs> <laughs> it on my phone. Uh, two and a half kilograms is five and a half pounds. Yeah, so I would say like female low end is five and a half pounds. Male high end is probably like, uh, is around 13 pounds. Like, I'm sure some of you all have cats that are way more than that, right? <laughs> They're tall, though. So I was talking about those, the sort of phenotypic, the physical differences between the Sac Valley and the non-native. And they're subtle, but on average, the Sac Valley foxes are, like, really tall and kind of, like, lean, sleek. Um, you know, like, if you look at the coat on this one, right, it's very sort of sleek looking, whereas the Sierra Nevada red fox is very full. I mean, it's a winter coat versus a summer coat. So that's not, <laughs> that's not the best comparison, but um, yeah. 
they're tall, skinny little things for sure. I think we got them. Cool. Thank you. It's great. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and thanks for identifying our, our little friend who is quite consistent. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Yeah, let me see. I'll have to look um look at our our lab data, but yeah, it'd be great if I could get you guys like a a little genetic profile on him. <laughs> and we're still uh, we're still seeing gifts shall we say left behind excellent excellent yeah and it could be you know it could be that it is more than one fox you know mm. possible too it wouldn't be a bad place no it's a beautiful place yeah also yeah that cow fire nursery there's so much prey over there too oh sure sure it's, on a, yeah, it's a great place and the, like, it's the fences, right? They have the fences. And I think like that really keeps them, they have these escape routes from coyotes. It's smart. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, they're welcome here. Good. And uh, they can chase the cats off. It's okay <laughs> with us. We can protect the birds. Yeah, right. Do you guys have feral cats there? Once in a while. I don't know if they're feral or if they are... The neighbor's cat, we have a barn right next, you know, at the neighbor house. And I, mm -hmm. I have a feeling that the cats that visit might live over there at the barn. Yeah. But come and eat our birds. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And again, just a reminder, we're back next month. Um, Joe Hobbs, our wildlife area manager, and he'll be talking about the improvements, um, water structure improvements and, and such that, and other things that are going on out in our wildlife area. So uh, just like tonight, you'd go online and sign up and we'll send you the link. All right, well, thanks so much. Thank Have you. a great evening, everybody. Bye, Thank everybody. you.